Afterlife, what happens once payments die in 2030? Now, our next guest, Christian Westerlin Wigstrom, was here, what, 18 months ago, was I think our last intersect, um, and he declared the death of payments by 2030. Uh, wow, you know, we were talking about cults a little bit earlier today, and you know, if you're going to do a doomsday scenario, that's a really interesting one. But we're going to sort of explore how do businesses survive in a world in which customers expect payments to be a thing of the past. It's time to prepare for payments afterlifes. Now, Christian is the CEO of Maneuver, a Sydney-based fintech that is freeing businesses to scale with a fully API-driven end-to-end payment solution. Born in Sweden, Christian moved to the UK to study after finishing his military service. While completing his PhD at Oxford, sorry, I should call you Dr. Christian, shouldn't I? I forget about that sometimes. He worked as an economic advisor and speechwriter for the UK in Parliament before spending three years of chief of staff and markets to a large agricultural startup in Zimbabwe. And then we got him in 2016. Welcome him to the stage at Intersect in Melbourne, Christian Westerlin Wigstrom. Thank you. This one. So, challenges with this talk immediately. One is um, I'm in the biggest room at the same time as there are three other sessions going on. And I also note that I'm dressed in essentially camouflage, which I never thought uh, this color would be. <laughs> but you can tell my face apart from the background and hopefully there are maybe my legs. So, um, as was uh, correctly pointed out, I'm, uh, my name is Christian. I'm the CEO of of Maneuver, a Sydney-based payments automation business. And today I'm going to talk about the afterlife. What happens when, payment, when payments die in 2030? And for that to be even a remotely understandable title, uh, it is important to know that it is a sequel to the last talk I gave at Intersect, again, correctly pointed out, in October 2019, when this was my first slide. And the story at that point was a very, very long historical analysis. I went back something like 40,000 years of payments evolution from the point of view of consumer expectations. And through an absolutely mesmerizing uh, array of disparate and diverse technical innovation, there was one simple thing that keep, kept popping up from 40,000 years ago and until to now. It was that at every step, Payments evolution was about making payments less like payments, because payments are really annoying. Payments is, uh, they're forcing you to interrupt something you don't want to interrupt, to part with something you don't want to part with. So if you can make payments slightly less annoying, it's probably a good thing for everyone involved. And so whether it was the innovation of banknotes, or credit cards, or, or PayPal, all the way through, payments was, were fading slowly into the background. And I pointed out one particular um, sort of milestone in this 40,000 year history, which was in 2010. In 2010, you had the first ever Uber ride. And the thrill that that one person, whose name I have no idea about, had when stepping out of a car without paying clearly was enough for us, 11 years later, to be taking Ubers and similar types of, of uh, share rides on every continent on Earth, possibly save Antarctica. And then I added 10 years. So we had 40,000 years of history, and then I snuck in 10 years of prophesizing until 2030, and just sort of kept going on those very, very long lines until 2030. And the not entirely surprising conclusion was that by 2030, no one's going to be paying anymore. The activity of paying, of fiddling with a phone, tapping a card, searching for coins in your, in your pocket, that is going to have disappeared by 2030. So if that was the story last time, going from 40,000 years before now, roughly, to 2019, it's a big jump, to 2030, slightly bigger jump, today's about the afterlife. What happens the day after no one is paying anymore? What does that world actually look like? And if we can get a, a, a modicum of understanding of the afterlife, can we prepare for it? And as so very often, prayer and incense is only part of the story for that preparation. And to help me tell this story, I want to introduce you to my imaginary friend, May. Now, May is going to see some friends in 2030, on the 5th of July. And she is leaving her home, stepping into a car. 
She takes the car to a restaurant. There we are. Seeing her friend. And after dinner, she goes via local shops, grabs a few things, and returns home. At no point in these four hours of May's life is she interrupting a phone call, saying, so sorry, I'm at the till now. I'll call you right back. One second. She's not fiddling with stuff. Instead, with the calmness that comes of never paying, she is concluding thoughts and reaching new insights, enjoying the view, and maybe actually having a proper conversation with her friend. But for that to work, for her not to be paying at any point here, her wallet is keeping very, very busy. To spell out the obvious ones, in the background, to assume something not too crazy, her wallet is paying for her car. A bit like Uber, but in 2030. To stretch it slightly further, but we're not, you know, not straying into sci-fi quite here, the menu that she used, the digital menu that she used to order her food is also charging her wallet. At the end of that dinner, she is not waiting for a waiter to show up with a single purpose piece of hardware that she has to tap a phone on or, or a card to get a piece of paper that she can save or not afterwards. She leaves, conversation carries on, and she goes to buy a few groceries. Now, May is very peckish, and she's going straight for the yellow M&Ms. But she's doing that without and afterwards having to stand in line with only one item, hoping that the person in front of her doesn't have 35 items, because she really wants these M&Ms. And so, a bit like Amazon Go, no surprises here either, uh, weight-sensitive shelving, cameras and sensors are doing the job for her of telling the shop what it was that she just got. But to make it slightly more exciting and slightly more sci-fi, she's not the only one buying stuff for herself. Her fridge is helping out. Being slightly more responsible in this relationship, the fridge is getting some milk while she's getting her M&Ms. Again, at no point here are we straying too far away from where we currently are. But the one thing that is quite different is the fact that the wallet that is paying for her Uber equivalent is still paying then for her dinner, pays for her M&Ms, and is also at the same time allowing her fridge to buy her milk. And for that to happen, for her at no point here to be disrupted and, and, disrupted and interrupted or just annoyed, there is a quiet revolution in how we transact. And now I'm going to go from the less speculative to the more speculative, knowing full well that I actually don't know what 2030 is going to look like. So these are some of the things that I think have to happen for this life after death of payments. So May's wallet, in all likelihood, will be highly linked to outsourcing. Because one easy, at least conceptually easy way of not paying for stuff is by outsourcing that to someone else, or in this case, something else. And the case of the fridge buying milk is often mentioned everywhere. I have yet to actually see a fridge that does it, but I know that there are fridges where you can look while you're in the shop actually doing the paying still. You know, you'll see a, you see a picture of the inside of your fridge and goes, aha, I knew I needed milk, or I didn't. But if you are allowing your fridge to buy milk, and again, we're probably not too far away from that, then why ever would you not allow your washing machine to buy your washing powder? and your car, maybe not to buy you petrol, because this is 2030 after all, but probably some windscreen wiper fluid, and oil, and other things that are still consumables. And maybe your light fittings will realize that that LED that never dies is actually about to die. And so all, you have all these things with their hands in your pockets, and they're spending stuff all over the place. And for you to be comfortable with that, for you to be able to outsource comfortably and actually conclude those conversations that currently you're not, you need control. So what I think is going to happen is you're going to get a, a centralized, managed system of your IoT devices, Internet of Things devices, smart, clever devices. And it's not going to be just the basics, for instance, that they know your bank balance, because don't shop stuff if you don't have the money. It might also be that even though you have the money, but you don't have milk, so you ought to buy milk, but you're on holidays, so you don't actually want the milk. So having an idea of your calendar might make sense. But the fact that you're going on holidays might also mean you don't want to spend as much in advance because you're saving for that holiday, and milk is really expensive in 2030. So having an idea of connecting all these things to your PFM tool, knowing that everyone, I'm talking to you, washing machine, stop spending as much in the next two months because I'm about to go somewhere. Outsourcing, the first thing. Second thing is speed. We've come pretty far in Australia in a very short period of time. I mean, three, and, three years and three months ago, we were still dreaming when we were talking about real-time transactions, when we talk about the speed of money once initiated. But what I'm talking about here is the speed of initiation itself. 
There's a study that shows that 80% of all Americans are living from paycheck to paycheck, which is why there is a, a growing and I think probably going to be a very successful industry of early access to pay. Not just in America, but obviously here too, we, we know some very good companies in this field. But if you start getting your money early, let's say once a day, why not once an hour, once every 10 minutes, or once a minute? And if that is happening with your pay, because I think in the not too distant future, employees are going to start thinking, wait a minute, I earned this money three weeks ago, so why am I not earning income on my salary that's still sitting with my employer? And so if you start getting paid all the time, then why would you also not expect that to go the other way around? Imagine a real-time flow of a very small fraction of your salary all the time into your account. And imagine then that being counter, like the, the counter side of that is a small fraction of your insurance, of your childcare, of your rent and mortgage, of your electricity bill being taken out all the time. The advantage of that is complete transparency. It is like holding your financial heart in your hand, seeing that enough blood comes in and enough blood goes out. And ideally, you're not bleeding. So speed of transactions, but speed of initiation of transactions is something that we'll see. And it helps out with the outsourcing because of transparency. It also helps the merchants because they're receiving funds faster. And they know that when someone just leaves the shop with a bag of M&M, they already have the money in their hands. Acceptance. This is harder, but as May walks around town doing stuff, she won't be able to sign up all the time because then she might as well be tapping her phone everywhere. So it has to be universal, except wherever you go, you have to be able to know that what I am bringing you is something you can accept. And this is probably less necessary for me to take on a life of, of no paying. But I also think that's something that's going to happen. We're rapidly moving into a world where there are many more currencies than there are countries. I mean, at the base level, China has two. There's one for international trade and one for domestic purchases. But then there are all the digital currencies. And there is World of Warcraft gold and there are loyalty points. The problem at the moment, the reason we don't use, say, crypto for, for purchases very often, some of us never, is because it's a really bad deal to buy something that depreciates quickly, like a tomato, with something that seems to, apart from yesterday night, appreciate, appreciate very quickly, like a Bitcoin. So you'd never swap a depreciating, uh, an appreciating asset for a depreciating one. But what Im imagine that if instead of the location deciding what currency you're paying with. So we're not talking about how you pay, but with what you pay here. Imagine that the good or service, the context, is the one that decides, and that you can optimize that. I have no idea how much time I spent by now, by the way, so I should uh, carry on. Uh, <laughs> so we can just pretend none of this is ever gonna happen. We can say that last 40,000 years have nothing to tell us, and this kind of stuff, well, you know, frankly, the world is going to look exactly the same then as now. And living in denial is really, really comfortable until you turn out to be Kodak or you turn out to be Nokia or Blockbuster. But, and this is where my carefully crafted dad joke is going to come up here. So bear with me. You can be the Soviet Union and pretend the world has not changed. You can be Easter Island and bring down the last tree on the island and not have a plan for tomorrow. Or you can be a chair and living in denial, thinking aging is not happening. Thank you, I appreciate the laughter. I had lots of other ones there, but I took them away. Um, okay, so how do businesses then prepare for this? Let's, let's presume we're not chair, we're not chair on Easter Island living in Soviet Union. We're us, we like this stuff. We think technological, technological challenges is sort of the stuff that makes it all worthwhile. Well, for businesses, who are not necessarily us specifically, but people that we interact with, one thing to understand is that payments experiences are not in any sense separate from the general customer experience. Another study, this one in the UK, showed that 36% of all restaurant visitors, in a subsample here, of course, found that the most annoying thing, with their, well, the least enjoyable thing with the whole evening was waiting for the bill. So you could have served them amazing food and great service and given them the perfect wine, and at the end of it, 36% went, that was a really bad evening because they had to wait for the bill and it took forever and the you know, thing didn't work. So if you can remove that, if you can understand that it all belongs together, you've come a very, very long way already. The second thing, of course, and well, don't even dream about building it yourself. Very, very few things. And looking at our friends here at Wise, who pointed out that even Google is not building their own payment systems anymore because maybe they realize it is not their core business. They're really, really good at some things, but this might not actually be it. Well, at least there are others, like Wise, who are better at it. That is also a really important thing to 
I believe, just accept, because it is hard, and it's getting harder. And I'm just talking about technology. Imagine if I had another slide on regulation here, and be like 2040. Um, so then we get to what you do. Well, you find a strategic payments partner, and voila, my favorite slide. So um, Manuva is, as I said, a, a Sydney-based payments automation business. We help businesses in Australia, some of which are international, uh, automate how they receive, manage, and pay funds across lots of different payment routes. We're quite young, not quite born yesterday, but we were founded uh, in something that is remotely similar to what we are now in 2017 as MoneyTake Payments. We're still a very proud member of the MoneyTake group. We changed our name, not quite the same international attention uh, when we changed from MoneyTake Payments to Maneuver that Transwise had when moving to Wise, but you know, we're moving at least. Uh, we've grown tremendously in the last few months, last years, and uh, the numbers are starting to be big. And I'm convinced that the source and reason for that growth is our focus at all times on real time. Not because it is the answer to everything, but because it is a very clear answer to a lot of things. And if we don't get that right, the rest sort of matters a bit less. If you can't move fun funds in real time, well, the rest of your consumer or customer experience is going to be slightly less relevant. So in this instance, what we do, and looking at an example here, but it could be others, uh, I'm using a digital marketplace here. We help people receive the funds through different uh, payment rails, real time, of course, being chief of, of those. We help them reconcile them in the middle because we can give you very, very large numbers of unique account numbers and pay IDs, and then we help you pay them out at the other end. So, returning, and I am getting to the end here, returning to the afterlife, back to the future. Is there a silver bullet here? It might be tarnished, but is there something that brings us from where we are now in 2021 to where I believe we will be in 2030? And the quite exciting thing is that actually, since 2019, something has come up. And that is smart, real-time pool payments. Uh, in Australia, that goes, well, it used to go in the name of Monday Payment Service. Turns out everyone's changing their names. It's now Pay2, Pay2 transactions. And one reason why all these chairs uh, are, uh, are empty here is, of course, because they're talking about another room. Um, but this here has a lot of promise. And you can look at the four different things I talked about. So the IoT, so smart appliances, or um, speed and, and acceptance and optimization. All of those can be solved, at least in part, by this. Imagine every single uh, appliance of yours having a mandate to spend money for you, but it's a smart, dynamic mandate that speaks to your PFM tool, your bank balance, and all the rest of it. All of a sudden, I feel slightly more comfortable allowing all these things to spend money for me. Real time, well, it is real time. And it also allows immediate initiation of things all the time because it is also real time created. It is universally accepted because all you need is a bank account and for the merchant to have a bank account. So you don't have to sign up to anything else. You don't need a four-party model or, or schemes or anything else. So it gives us an awful lot with not that much revolutionary as it is. In fact, I think push payments are going to be dead by 2032. So it's not just paying is going to die, it's push paying is going to die, uh, and we'll only have pool payments left. So is any of it actually going to happen? So far, you've sort of been going on faith, and you're going to actually, frankly, keep going on faith. I think it is. I think there is enough evidence to suggest that all these things are stuff that's going to happen because consumers want it, and when consumers want something, when 36% of your customers think that this is a bad experience because you haven't figured it out, you do something about it. In the last 40,000 years, if they show us anything is that there is progress and it's speeding up very rapidly. The question then, of course, the second one is, but is it going to be 2030? Well, I think here that the answer is we decide. So it took WeChat Pay eight years to build something that is not entirely dissimilar from this and to reach 800 million customers. And if they can do that in eight years, imagine what we can do in nine. And with that, thank you very much and I hope you have questions at some point. Hopefully we do. Thank you, Christian. Now, I was thinking about what you were talking about with the Uber experience, and we're both Sydney siders, and I want to paint a picture of that. Because I reckon the New South Wales government cottoned onto this pretty quickly, because if you don't know, we run the most expensive and extensive road toll system in the world. You can't drive somewhere in Sydney without having to pay. And of course, it went from the old days when you went across the Harbour Bridge and you'd throw a $2 coin in the basket, 
to the electronic transfer payments, and then we've got the eToll passes, which you have down in Melbourne as well, um, and they automatically top up. Which brings me to the point of we create this seamless thing and the picture you're painting, what stops us from spending as much money as we do in areas because we don't feel the physical pain of the transaction anymore. And try and talk about the danger of us overspending. Are we going to have a push notice that kicks us up the bum saying, hey, listen, stay out of Dan Murphy's for a couple of days or what's going to go on here? I mean, the first point to note is you're saying it's, it's bad that we're removing physical pain, which is not necessarily true. Um, but the second thing is, of course, that mandates here have a real role to play. And the mandate, to use uh, MPPA jargon or terminology, is something that can be made entirely specific. And again, if you start being clever about it, it's not just a fixed thing that's static, that's set at one point and then you forget about it, but it's dynamic and actually it's attuned to how much you've spent elsewhere and how much you have left. And if you can start saying, you know what, I want to be told when I've used up 90% of my toll road, road balance this month and I'll start staying at home again, um, that is certainly not conceptually impossible. So I think there's actually more transparency in this because what ends up happening in a, in a world of real-time initiation of real-time transactions is that you're not surprised at the end of the month by an electricity bill or something. You can sit there, have all the heating on in your house and all the light bulbs, and you will look at that heart of your finances bleeding more than it should, and you guys should turn off that light. And if you do the same thing, paying your toll road as you drive, rather than just bump all of a sudden, I imagine, I certainly would feel like I had a much better understanding of my finances. And the only reason we have these batch lump things that happen every month or quarter, whatever it is, is because our systems so far haven't been able to handle anything else. If that is not an issue, then why wouldn't we go there? Great answer. Now, your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Anyone got one? In that case, you've earned yourselves an early mark. Please put your hands together for Christian Westland Wigstrom from Maneuver. And we'll break for afternoon tea and come back for our final session. Thank you.